he would never moralize. He would observe. So that's where he and I would probably separate on Mark Zuckerberg. Because for about eight years now, I think he belongs in prison. And McLuhan wouldn't put him in prison. McLuhan would just try to understand what he's doing and kind of let us know that. Hey, welcome back to the Chesterfield, a comfy place where we talk about Canadian culture. I'm Ben Rayner. And I'm Isque. Each week on the Chesterfield, one of us will be sitting down with a great Canadian artist via video chat from their homes across the country. They will reveal to us a piece of Canadian content, be it a book, film, TV series, PSA, other artwork that has shaped their lives. And we'll explore the impact of that Canadian artwork on the world. When it comes to Canadians who've shaped contemporary culture, there are really are a few peers to Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan was a writer, a philosopher, and a true visionary. In the 1960s, he coined the phrases global village and the medium is the message, which are both with us today. He also predicted the existence of the World Wide Web a long time before it was a thing. And I'm honored this week to be able to talk about McLuhan and his work with the esteemed Canadian actor R.H. Thompson, who you probably know from some of Canada's most beloved TV series, including Road to Avonlea and Anne with an E. He's also one of the most renowned stage actors this country's ever had. And in fact, in 2018, he actually played Marshall McLuhan on stage in a play called The Message for Toronto's Tarragon Theatre. And man, he was a good choice to do it, because I thought I knew McLuhan a little bit from my days as a journalism student, and he went way over my head. Can you imagine predicting the World Wide Web? Like, what, what in your brain needs to be happening to go, I think in the future, there will be this thing called the internet and everybody can communicate no matter where they are in the world. Yeah, if only McLuhan was that easy to comprehend. It's more <laughs> like, it's more like I, I think I say it to R.H. Thompson, it's more like reading James Joyce's Ulysses sometimes <laughs> than, than like media criticism. Right. It's, right, right, it's heady right. stuff. And I gotta tell you, R.H. Thompson knows it inside out. Mm. Well, it sounds like you have a deep conversation to get into, so I'm going to leave you for now. But a reminder before I go that the Chesterfield is produced by Friends of Canadian Broadcasting. Friends is a non-profit citizens group powered by individual Canadians who care about seeing Canadian culture and values reflected on screen. Please visit iamcancon.ca to get involved in this important campaign. Link in the video description. Thanks, this way as always. Now, let's bring up Mr. R.H. Thompson. Hello, R.H. Thompson. Welcome to the Chesterfield. I'm on my, I'm actually on my Chesterfield this season. Well, last, last okay. season I sat in a chair on the other side of the room. But, <laughs> um, well, we're really thrilled to have you on here. Um, and, and I'm kind of excited to talk to you because I, I was a journalism student. I studied Marshall McLuhan uh, in, in, in school in the 90s. And I understand you would like to talk about Marshall McLuhan today as, as a, you know, a, I guess a Canadian cultural icon who cast a long shadow over you. So my, my first question to you is, I guess, how did, you, how did you come to McLuhan in the first place and when? And also, was there a specific work that, that drew you in and, and captured your imagination? Uh, I came to McLuhan when I was about to go into university because my father actually taught university and he taught at U of T and he kind of knew McLuhan and he knew Innes and he knew that kind of crowd. He wasn't in the crowd. And he said, you got to read the Gutenberg Galaxy. So I started reading the Gutenberg Galaxy and I didn't get past page one without getting totally confused. And so it was, uh, it was like, what? trying to read a man who did not think, think literally, literally, and yet was uh, a total uh, famous media figure and was obviously saying, saying things very, very, um, very interesting and pertinent things. And the kind of uh, switchover moment for me, as I was trying to read the Gutenberg Galaxy going, oh yeah, I, so I sort of understand about Gutenberg and the printing press, okay. But I wasn't, couldn't really grasp the paragraphs because they didn't make linear sense. And at the same time, I was doing math at U of T. And we were, I think we're doing, I don't know, we're doing three-dimensional equations or whatever, three-dimensional time. I can do a three-dimensional equation because I can think of a three-dimensional equation. And then I said, okay, we're gonna do a four-dimensional equation. I'm like, 
um, can I think of four dimensions? I thought, okay, yeah, I can sort of think of four dimensions. Okay, well, now we're going to eight, do an eight-dimensional equation. And my linear brain went, uh-uh, uh, turn off, turn off, turn off, because I couldn't think linearly how eight dimensions work. But there came a kind of slip point that I went, I don't actually have to think about eight dimensions. I have to kind of imagine them sideways out of my head and I can accept an eight dimensional space. And that's what I did with McLuhan as well. I would read the paragraph and go, I don't actually get what he's saying, but if I sort of slip out the side door of my imagination and don't try to make linear sense of it, I get it. And so paralleling the Gutenberg galaxy and where McLuhan was going became a way of kind of opening lateral thinking that didn't really have logical sense, but really got you places. And that's when I started turning on to him. It's funny you talk about eight dimensional spaces. I'm sitting in front of a, a wall of uh, theoretical physics books. I kind of like that stuff, but it, I, it reminds me of McLuhan in that you kind of have to get in that headspace and, and, and forget everything you, <laughs> you knew previously and absorb it, right? Yeah, you got to roll with it. You can't let the little sort of uh, logical inconsistencies trip you up. You got to roll right through those and see if you can sort of feel the swimming pool that he's making. The cool thing about his, his ideas um, is that you can have, I mean, he was talking about television and, and the intersection of electronic and print media and stuff like this in the 60s. Oh, I mean, he predicted the web, right? The World Wide Web. But I, I, I like that his, I mean, his central messages can be applied to any new technology. And we're, we see it these days with, with you know, the, the, the complete dominance of things like streaming services or, or, or YouTube on, on culture. So I, I feel like, you know, he's very malleable in that sense, right? You, you, I think what he was saying in the 60s is just as valid today. Would you agree? Totally. I mean, it's even more so. I mean... We, we need him more than ever. We need those kind of voices. We need that kind of perception um, because, you know, we've stepped off a, press, a digital prefaces, a precipice and we don't really know what's at the bottom. You know, you have, you have government saying, you know, I have to create something called a right to be forgotten. What the fuck is a right to be forgotten? Well, the creation of the new media, the digital media, the platforms has created a place with no memory because all memory is eternally present. And that's it. We have never lived in that space before. And so you actually have to, to counteract that kind of digital nightmare, which is there is no memory here because all memory is present. Therefore, there is no memory. You have to create memory by creating the right to be forgotten. So that means that some poor people have to go back through all those sites and start to delete that stuff. And so these kind of problems are absolutely, it's not just about Facebook turning off Australia because they think, you know, Facebook's a bit like uh, you know, the East India Company or the Hudson's Bay Company. They're a large commercial corporate kind of colonist, right? They, they colonize commercially around the world. Well, Facebook's a new version of the East India Company. And they are colonizing these imaginations and consciences around the world through Oh, we're just a platform, they say. No, 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 they're not a platform. They're a portal to a whole existence in which there are different sets of rules. And it's just like saying, the, the you know, the Hudson's Bay guys who came to Northwestern Ontario, well, we don't care about the First Nations people. We're just here, you know, give them some beads and we'll get some pelts and we'll all be richer. No, 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 no. The, the, uh, the traders who were doing beads for beaver, for beaver pelts were in fact seriously altering, and in this case, catastrophizing the cultures of other people. Well, that's Facebook. It's a new kind of imperial colonialism. So again, with the old glasses, we only see the old colonialism. Yeah, I understand the colonialism of, of, of Buckingham Palace. Yeah, I get that. But that's only looking in the rear view mirror. The new colonialism is Facebook, it's Amazon, it's Google, and they are colonizing us at a speed that is astounding. And we're desperate to A, see what they're doing and B, catch up to them. It's, um, I mean, McLuhan did say, if you don't actually know the technology that's running it, running you, you are actually a servant of it. The thing with him is nothing's necessarily good or bad either, right? He was just like, it's the way we employ it and the way it influences us that, that, that shapes. But there, like, the, there's yeah. no actual like, moral judgment to be applied to a technology in itself, right? No, and that's a really good point because that's one 
thing I was always kind of ambivalent about him, he would never moralize. He would observe. So that's where he and I would probably separate on Mark Zuckerberg, because for about eight years now, I think he belongs in prison. And McLuhan wouldn't put him in prison. McLuhan would just try to understand what he's doing and kind of let us know that. But really, what the Europeans say, we need a law about the right to be forgotten, not just a platform, not just a portal, not just a business opportunity, not just a wonderful connector for 3.2 billion people. But it's actually created a different world in which justice is different, retribution is different, memory is different, all that is different. And as because McLuhan says, if you don't understand the media that you're in, you're the servant of it. Only now, belatedly, are we starting to understand how it's running us. You know, the first thing we clicked on is with, with platforms and online stuff is if you're not paying for the service, you're the product. And that was the first kind of like wake up that if it's free online, no, it's not free. It's free because you're the product in some way. You know, you've been a fixture on Canadian television, specifically quite, you know, specifically the CBC for, for a long time. I mean, how is how has the, uh, the arrival of all these new digital platforms and, and Facebook and stuff like that impacted what you do? I mean, if you, you must have, I mean, I don't know how much you can talk about it, but I have a feeling that, that Netflix and Anne with an E, can, Anne with an e is, is in trouble. And, and I, I have a feeling that, you know, behind the scenes, there is a very good story there about the intersection of new technologies and Canadian broadcasting. But you must you felt it, eh? Like in, in your own experience, perhaps. <laughs> Another understatement of the year. <laughs> it's it, well, there's so much to talk about in there. I mean, you got about 14 hours, and you know, I get a soapbox, and I got all me. day. I'm on this box, and I'm going. The teeter totter, and where I fear for the creative community, is between the industry and the art and the tension between the two. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, things weren't better back then because there was a lot less work, but we were, you know, making out the books and telling the stories and there were composers and there were sculptors and we were very small and there was no money in the system. And we were actually turning out stories that whether they were well done or not, were important to Canadians because they were all about being Canadians. You know, They didn't have any, the, the consciousness of gender or racial issues, but at least they said, we have to be speak about who we are. There was no industry. That was all down in Hollywood, New York, and London. There was no industry because we just were a little out of the place. And I spent some time in LA, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to have a Hollywood career here. I go down with my mini series and I'm going to have a big, big career. I'm going to work with them again. Anyway. And this, it's, I go out on these series of editions for scripts that really aren't good enough to be doorstoppers at my front door. <laughs> They're the industry crank out, right? They're waka da waka da waka of that. But I thought, you know, Hollywood creates some great movies. And I thought, I want to be in those great movies. And I realized the great movies that Hollywood creates, you know, are the little, whatever, the 4%, the 5% of the top, which are fantastic films because they have great artists, they're great directors, they're great writers, oh my God. So I finally left because I thought my chances of, you know, existing in Hollywood in the 5% of great artists that I want to be with, they're nil. I'm never going to get up there. I'm going to spend my time working in the industry part. And I came back to Canada thinking, I want us to have a big industry. I want us to be vibrant in the stories we tell. And I want artists and writers and everyone to be able to make their lives telling the stories. But I don't want what I saw in L.A., However seductive it is and sexy it is and powerful it is, I don't want it. Because the commercial part of it starts dulling the creative imagination. And I did notice that a lot of the fantastic actors and directors left LA. They're living in the East Coast. They're living in Chicago. They're not living in Los Angeles. And what's happened here is, because I think last year, Toronto had something like $2 billion worth of film and television production, which is stunning which is great because that is a lot of work. That's work for the designers and crews, the drivers, the actors, the writers. It's fantastic. So we have a bigger and bigger art scene, but it's more and more like the industry that I didn't want to see because it's turning out product. And I don't think 
that Sorry, that's my you. that's my problem with it. No, so I the didn't fact mean that to cut you off there. All right, I, I was going to say though, like I mean, it was difficult enough, you know, before we had kind of an established industry, be it commercial or otherwise, to to kind of defend our own voice as Canadians against that deluge of industrial product. And I think that deluge of industrial product is, you know, it's more of a cataract now, right? Like it's, 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 it's worse than ever. And it's, it's harder than ever, I think, to find, to, to, to fight against it and find our own voice as Canadians. And I wonder what is the role of government, I guess, in, in, in protecting our voice against all this industrial product? The role of government is pretty limited, but the role of government is pretty important because what the commercial sector tends to do is, which is why if you go into a supermarket, you'll see one whole aisle of potato chips, potato chips on one side, potato chips on the other side. And most of those potato chips are basically from two or three companies. And I know there's 30 companies that produce potato chips, but they're not in the Metro. They're not in the Loblaws. Those aisles are just the big companies. So it's what we call shelf space. So we say, of course we want American product here. They make some fantastic product. Of course I want to see Brazilian films and British films and all the rest of it. I want to see all that. But I want to make sure there's space on the shelf for Canadian stories for people who want to go see them. There's got to be space on the shelf. And if you take the supermodel model, supermarket model, there's no space because the commercial boys and girls work out their deals where only their potato chips or their the soft drinks are on that major shelf. So the government's role is through either regulation or study or some ways of arranging the marketplace to saying there has to be space on the shelf for this work. So if I go into the supermarket, I go, oh yeah, Norwegian film, Hollywood film, great French film. Oh yeah, there's a Canadian film. I have to see it there. There has to be some money there because, again, we don't have the economy of scale to actually fund a robust film television industry. I mean, our film industry, our film industry has been a sick puppy since its very, very beginning. It keeps making occasionally some really, really interesting films. And then there's all the we hope to bees, we hope to bees, we hope to bees, like the little puppy hopping along three legs. The television industry has done better because it takes a lot less money to make it go. And your potential audience, if you can sell it abroad, is wider. So the government is there only, and the only things we think of at the moment, the tools in the toolbox are direct subsidy, which is very vulnerable to different governments, right? Uh, so we do indirect subsidies, which are called labor tax credits. And you get provinces like Saskatchewan under Scott Moe, who whatever, eight years ago, he said, labor tax credits, get out of here. We shouldn't be helping that program that's shooting at Saskatoon. He cut them and all the television producers left Saskatchewan. Well, it happened, it happened in Nova Scotia too, right? A few yeah, years ago yeah. where they cut their... No, but that, that's the thing. I guess so much. I think you, I, I watched you on a clip of you on Strombo the other day. Actually, there's a really good quote uh, from, from that show that I have in front of me where you said, if you don't hear the stories of your life, your community's life, your nation's life, you don't exist. And we here at uh, the Chesterfield and Friends of Canadian Broadcasting totally <laughs> agree. So like, but, but again, it's, it's, I don't know how you do it when it's so hard to get a return, as you were just saying, like you have to do the, this is the quandary that the industry is in, in this country. Like you have to do the commercial stuff. You have to play ball with the American interests in order to, to, to do something profitable. And in order to do some, you know, the, 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 to satisfy your artistic ambitions, you, you got to take public money, right? To, 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 you can't, it's so hard to make a return on it. And I, I don't know how we find our way out of this, this, you know, pickle. The Juno Awards has just come up. Well, why are they the Juno Awards? Because a guy called Pierre Juno said, there has to be a regulation on the radio. Radio stations have to play a certain amount of Canadian music. And when he said, right, he was working for the government, when Juno said that the private radio station said, oh, it's a catastrophe, there's no good Canadian music. Well, they actually spawned the Canadian music industry. And so we call the Juno Awards after him. So that is one of the effects that in, an enlightened public body can have in the marketplace. So what we're trying to do now, because they're, right, they're still talking in Ottawa about how do we, you can't, you know, Stephen Harper said, you can't, you can't, tax, what he said, a Netflix tax. We're going to put a tax on Netflix. We weren't putting a tax on Netflix. We were just saying to Netflix, you have to play by the same rules as Canadian producers. But they, Netflix has used the fiber optic 
and the new technology to slide around that. So that's all playing catch up as it were. I really do think like McLuhan would, his head would be spinning over this stuff today. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess you, I, well, I have to ask you um, because you've been on, the, you know, a, a fixture on the CBC and, you, and you've talked a bit of, of you know, you've been spoken quite passionately about the need to defend it in, in, in the past, but how do we keep the CBC going in, in this age when the, its budget is shrinking and there's so much competition and, and, you know, I know we don't, yeah, you probably can't talk about Anne with a knee being in trouble, but, but that to me seems insane when there's something that's hugely popular globally, but the CBC can't probably can't afford to do it on its own. And then you have someone like Netflix, I'm theorizing here, come in and, and, and kind of rock the boat a bit, but how do we ensure that the CBC and, and Canadian broadcasters are strong and present here for, for future generations down the road. What do we do? I think you have to have the courage of Australia. You just have to say, this is the rule. We're not asking, we're telling you. And you got, you have to stand up to that kind of stuff. I mean, you got to be wily and you got to be smart and all the rest of it, but, and you have to, you have to continually Reburnish, reimagine, reaffirm why a public space in the media is invaluable. And as much as we think of the digital platforms, and here I am, I'm talking to my 432,000 Facebook friends. Oh, I'm in a public space. No, 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 no. You're not a public space. You're in a totally a privately controlled space. So it's constantly re-educating and reinforming Canadians what a public space is and what it does that the private spaces don't do. It's interesting in the cities when you see pedestrians and bicyclists trying to claim part of the street back. And people say, you can't have that. You, you, you can't have planters in that street. I mean, you'll interrupt my business. I mean, I won't get many people to my restaurants. You go, wait a minute, whose city is this? Whose streets are these? These are public streets. So in fact, the fight for bike lanes and all this kind of stuff on the streets is trying to make our streets public again, that we define what public is so narrowly, the place to drive cars and trucks on, and we left out everything else about being public. So again, it's a vigorous informed, which is why the friends is so important, a vigorous and informed, constant trying to encourage people to think what you lose when you lose a public space. And there's many ways to do that, but you got to do it all the time. You never win, you know? I will so, say one way people can help do that is to join. And I know you'll agree with me because you're a supporter is to join friends of Canadian broadcasting yeah, because we're yeah. fighting for all this stuff. Yeah. And I, and it is important. It is important to have our own voice. Um, thanks so much. I could talk to you for hours. Thanks again for coming and talking to us. We really appreciate it. It's nice uh, talk to you.